I'm Mark Hennick. This is So-Called Normal. Hey folks, welcome to So-Called Normal. I'm Mark Hennick. Today on the show, I have Elvira Kurt. Uh, I've known Elvira for, or, or I shouldn't say known her, I'm making it sound like we're best friends. We first met one time, uh, probably about a decade ago, uh, when we brought her into an event at my undergraduate um, uh, college, St. Thomas University in Fredericton, New Brunswick. And I want to talk to her a bit about that uh, event, but also to delve into, we've had a, a comedians on the show before, delve into a little bit more about where that um, that material comes from, that energy comes from. So uh, you've seen Elvira Kurt uh, certainly on the Just for Laughs stage and comedy clubs all over Canada and university campuses everywhere. Her show, Pop Cultured, um, she's a Second City alumnus. I'm going to let her tell you all about her because she's sitting right in front of me. Hey, Elvira I'm Kurt, welcome. welcome to the show. Thank you so much. <laughs> Although I think you'll have a hard time having me tell you about all of my Accomplishments. All your accomplishments, yeah. because you are very accomplished. You've been doing comedy, what, now? Yeah, more than 30 years? More than 30 years. But wow. that's not the reason why I struggled to tell you about them. It's just, it's difficult to talk about the things that you've done, the accomplishments. Yeah, uh, yeah, it's, yeah. I get that, too. I recently had to... Um, rewrite my bio which is a so weird thing I know this is like right? the worst thing ever <laughs> you writing about yourself in the third person exactly yeah and, uh. and but then it I've been trying to my, my New Year's resolution, or I should say my New Year's um, commitment to myself, my New Year's intention. I don't like resolutions. But anyway. It's a stupid word. It's a stupid word. Uh, but is to celebrate more, to be more joyful. You know, it's so sure. easy, especially for somebody like me with depression for right, a long right. time I have, and to shit on myself It's amazing day, right? that, it, that, it, that that's an effort. It is. To, well, like, it I'm is. going to focus on joy and that that's something that no, we all struggle with. Not it's a lot the of people condition. get that, I know. I think. Some people, or may, I don't know, maybe it's just my idealized version of other people. Yeah, But I feel too. like it comes easier to other people. Totally. <laughs> sure. I'll say. read someone else's bio and I'll be like, why didn't I write that? Why didn't exactly. I write it like that? That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. I would so, love to see this person well, perform. So I read this. mine. I read my bio and I'm like, man, eh, she's so it. full of herself. Somebody mentioned, somebody complimented me the other day and I always discount compliments uh and i uh, did they call you a handsome devil they didn't i wish they did well you are i should get back in touch with them (laughs) you should (laughs) have but i said my response to it was you know he's mark's better on paper (laughs) he's what you read on paper isn't what you get wow because that's how how i see myself but you know enough about me your material is deeply personal as well and i remember you know you drawing on your your own experience coming out and and uh, with your your mother who i believe was hungarian she's hungarian Hungarian. um so tell me a bit more about your background and how you've drawn your your material from that well you know when you when you mention that and that you say that you know that was from 12 years ago it feels like a lifetime because i've been through so many Mm. iterations of comedy both on the scene and then my own personal evolution and one of the great advantages to having been doing this for so long well over 30 years of stand-up comedy could be 35 i started in (laughs) 19 84, I think, yeah. was the goal that I had set for myself. And uh, how, to, how did you start? What, what, I just, what you, uh, you know, I'd been going to amateur nights at Yuck Yucks when it was on uh, Cumberland in Yorkville there. And I'd been going for many weeks and and had sort of realized that you didn't even need to be funny. You just needed to be courageous. Mm. And I thought, well, I, I think I have the comedy. I, all I need to do is have the nerve. Mm-hmm. But it's very telling that even then... I set an arbitrary date. It was like, you know, by December 9th, which was my birthday, <laughs> I got to I got to do a, an open mic, a, mm-hmm. an amateur night. But I didn't tell anybody. I didn't tell any of my friends. And to this mm. day, it is the hardest part of doing stand up is letting people know. So it is exactly contrary to the whole point of doing it, which mm. is to get as many people right. in to see you, to build a following. And, and I actually, you know like, or? I push them away. That's probably not why I mm. perform, right? Mm. Back then, I had no awareness that I was struggling with this. I just, it was my own personal thing. Right. I didn't think anybody needed to know. I, I'm sure I believe that who would come? I won't right. be hurt if I don't tell anybody, right? right? If nobody shows up and I haven't told them, then I won't have a reason to feel bad about myself. I didn't right. understand then that I was probably doing comedy to survive. Hmm. Do you know, do what, you know do, what, what do you mean by that? Why, well, what did it do for you? Uh, you know, my relationship with performing has changed 
so much over the years, but the reason that I do stand-up comedy now is because I I love it. Mm. And I got into it because I believed I loved it. But as I look back, I think that it was a way to make up for so many things that I had missed in my childhood. Mm. Approval, mm. validation. Nothing just like being, the standing ovation, right? Right. Well, <laughs> and, and, but then conversely, mm. you know, when it went badly, it mm. would, I would plummet mm. because I was putting so much value on, on the audience reaction. I didn't mm. make the connection not until, you know, probably after at that time that you saw me and at that, at your undergrad. Um, so only within the last 10 years, I hadn't made the connection that, really? that the audience was standing in for my parents. It seems like such a cliche, but it's it's real. I'm, I can, can't speak for other comedians. That's but. actually really deep because one of, one of the things that I, I do a lot of public speaking, that's yeah. kind of my main gig. And I don't think I'd made that connection yet <laughs> because oh, <wow>. I, I really... <laughs> do we have a therapist on well, standby? Well, so I was just going to say, usually people come into this little tiny, dark, hot studio and I'm the one, uh, you know, hopefully yeah. opening them up. Right, but right. I think I just had a realization about myself. Yeah. That's pretty deep. Like I really, and I had to do a lot of work. I had to make a really conscious disconnection between who the, the audience is. And, you know, when I took that pressure off of yeah. them to, to be the Kurtz which are my parents, I was able to enjoy it more, mm -hmm. but then also not wear the disappointment as mm -hmm. much. So the highs weren't as high and the lows weren't as low. It was more authentic to a work experience mm -hmm. as opposed to having it intertwined with my identity or my mm -hmm. survival or my definition of myself. Yeah. Do you think that was in terms of the, I don't even know the, how, you, how you say it, but the char the nature of your comedy, was it as... Um, cutting, I guess, was it as as uh, big, you know? Because sometimes when people bring a lot of emotion right. to it, then it really delivers. But of course, we see people burn out from that too. Sure, um, it was always personal, and uh, I think it was as you know as as intelligent as it could be for where I was at the time. So mm. I've I've always thought of myself as intelligent. I think a lot of comedians who Mm -hmm. do well or the ones that I'm attracted to their work have an intelligence like a baseline of mm -hmm. it but I I mean an emotional intelligence mm -hmm. that I've only been able to achieve since I've started therapy where right. I the material is deeper yeah. it's it's richer so you know it's always been dark mm -hmm. it's is that's the through line my comedy is always quite mm -hmm. dark is it edgy? Well, only because I'm talking about things that are harder to make funny. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it is, that is edgy. Or if you're talking about sex yeah. or, you know, sort of base human desires, those are easier to mine or to, you yeah. know, get a sort of a shock reaction. But to talk about shame or failure mm -hmm. or hurt and to make it funny, that's mm -hmm. much harder to do. But it does make a deeper connection. And yes. I enjoy it more. And it's more authentic. I mean, this is this seems to be, um, and I guess you, you would know this much better than I, but uh, uh, qu quite a trend in comedy right now when you look at things like Nanette or The Great Depression on Netflix, things that are very deeply personal, right. often about mental illness, people talking about depression and suicide right. and identity yeah. and coming out and all kinds of things. But it's not from a, you know, it's it, the nature of it it isn't a Louis C.K. or a Ricky Gervais kind of, or actually not even Ricky, because his, his show now, Afterlife, is, Afterlife, is yeah, really quite good. For sure, yeah. Um, but the point is, it's not making fun of depression. It's not mm -hmm. making fun of suicide or coming out. Right. It's it's drawing from that real experience. Yeah, no, it's people just blatantly announcing what their struggles are and mining comedy from it. It's mm -hmm. it's a it's an amazing trend. I have seen so much. Mm -hmm. in the decades that I've done it and comedy has just gone through all of these shifts and mm -hmm. it, and this this latest one where people are not not only touching on it but uh, you know using that as the jumping off point mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's still hard to do well yeah. right like I've been in audiences you know in shows that I've been where where comics have you know broached the subject and have not taken care of the audience mm. so then you know there's this an audience is sort of thrown off and you know 
not trusting that mm-hmm. they're going to be taken care of. And, you know, where is this going to end mm-hmm. funny or am I just going to feel really sad or scared or how right. am I going to hold this person? And why do I have to hold them? I just came here to have a good time. Right. 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 Like it changes the role of the relationship. And that's when it's someone who's not, you know, they're either working it out. So, you know, come back in a couple of years, you'll see where this bit goes. Yeah. Or it's someone who never will. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then at the other extreme, you have people who you know, thought it out very well yeah, yeah. and then they can come out and you know get real laughs from it and, yeah. and have an audience really on their side i think a big part of um those emotional disclosures you know certainly you can come out and try to shock the audience but if it's something really personal that you know a lot of people in the room probably have been through too yeah then i think you have to do a lot you have to do a lot of the safety building up front so For that sure. way when it comes people know that you're joking because even if you're a comedian i think i don't right. do comedy but you know I, I talk about suicide most of the time yeah. and my talks are surprisingly funny i don't go up there and I talk because right. I'm talking about my own experience. Right. Um, but I think, it, it, like like I said, to do that, there's a lot of work that happens up front. So that pe- way people know that, you know, you're you're doing this to get through, to help them get mm-hmm. through it, to understand it better. Yeah. Uh, and to, to have a more authentic relationship with the material. Yeah. I, I, I think that's true. There's it's a skill that you don't set out to do in right. comedy, which is. Prepare the audience for difficult things, right? You just, you know, when I started, I never thought about their experience. Right. It wasn't until I first came out in my act that I realized what I was doing, right? I would do it first, and then only after some time did I realize, oh, I'm waiting until I have them on my side before I tell them that I'm a lesbian. Interesting. Right? And Was that hard for you to do on stage? Because that was one of those things that it seems like now isn't a big deal. Right. But certainly, you know, sure, the it 80, was, 80s through, or yeah. up until the 2000s, right? it was no, a big deal. It was, it, was, it was a big risk. I mean, the very first time I performed for a gay audience was uh, at a show at U of T. A promoter here brought in... Uh, a troupe that had been of individual comics performing under the banner of funny gay males. Mm -hmm. And they asked me to open for them. And, um, and so it was the first time that I could actually be myself, but then it meant that I couldn't go back to a mainstream comedy club Mm. and, and be the comedian that I had been before I'd done the show. I couldn't just go up there and and either ignore it, right? The way Ellen did most of her career was not talk about that material at all. Like, I can be a comedian. I don't have to talk about my personal life. Mm. I felt like I couldn't talk about that. And besides that, I just had this profoundly liberating moment of being my real self with my guard down. How could I go back to then being on stage with all these walls up? It felt very limiting, and I could see how bored I would become Mm. by hiding this part of myself. So then really, I, I'm telling you, I didn't have that kind of forethought because I didn't have any self-awareness back mm. then. It was like sleepwalking. Yeah. Um, but but do you, re- you certainly must have, uh, or, or I assume you write your material out beforehand? I or do you do not. You don't? Oh, interesting. So I you just kind of go that, with it? And that was also something that was, um, that I spent many years berating myself for. I didn't celebrate the fact that I do comedy sort of, instinctively or instinctually yeah. or you know I have ideas and I organize them loosely but I when I step on stage I I try to plug in to the to the present with varying de- degrees of success and yeah. based on that being plugged in to the present connecting to the flow as yeah. it were then we see where we go we have a vague idea but there's so many ways to get to the different you know, uh, milestones or markers right. that I that we'll see what we do together, me and the audience. Yeah. But uh, to finish my thought about, you know, how I went back to a mainstream club after having, you know, come out in my act, I think I must have thought, well, I can't open with it. Mm-hmm. I have to make sure that that I have them laughing mm. and then I'll tell them. And then, you know, from there, again, because I hadn't written anything down, it was it was easy to find the next material mm-hmm. right on the spot because I would, you know, warm them up. Mm-hmm. I'd have them in the palm of my hand. Then I'd tell them I was a lesbian mm-hmm. through a joke. It came out as a punchline. And then what followed was the silence. Mm. And so I had to point out to the audience, by the way, you know, before I told you, you were laughing and having a great time. And then I tell you, 
And now it's crickets. What's up with that? Right. The only thing that's different is you, right? And so it was. I love um, comedy that makes you look at yourself. Yeah, you know, no, like, it was great. Yeah. It was, you know, I got such great laughs, but I couldn't continue to do that material because, you know, for, for a while I, I could, but I can't come out right. every show. Right. And it's so far behind me now yeah. that, you know, I don't do any material that isn't from a queer perspective. Mm -hmm. Everything is. That's the lens I view the world through. Now, do you remember your coming out joke? Sure. Yeah, of course. Well, it was, can, can you um, share it with us? Yeah, it was about um, uh, how unselfconscious we were as kids, you know, that we didn't care about what we looked like. Yeah, like, do you remember having a bad hair day when you were, when you were a kid? Uh, you know, did you... You didn't. You'd go to bed with your hair standing. You'd wake up in the morning, your hair standing straight on end. You know, I've been sleeping in my bathing suit, and I feel fine. Did you sleep in your bathing suit when you were a kid? And then I'd, I'd mind pulling it over. I, I wouldn't even take it off to go to the bathroom. <laughs> Just moved it on over. And I think parents took advantage of us not caring what we look like. Do you see photos of yourself when you were a kid? How did your parents dress you? I mean, I re remember playing in a, an outfit my mother made for me. It was a hot pink crocheted pantsuit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure she sent me out the door and then she, you know, pulled the curtain aside and, and just, you know, have a chuckle. I can't believe she's wearing that. But that's OK. 20 years later, when I told her I was lesbian, I blamed it on the pants. <laughs> I can't rem believe I remember that. It's been so long uh, that's since a I solid told joke. Her. It's well constructed. I like I like the, the build up for it. That's right. Great. So, uh, you know, at that moment, the audience would be like, ah, what did you just yeah, say? Yeah, wait, well, hold on. Wait, go back. <laughs> right. And then, you know, and then I would play with the audience for a bit. It's, yeah. you know, I. I do what they were giving me, which yeah. was the silence, and I take them through their little thought process of just wait. If you're a lesbian, does that make us gay? <laughs> well, and I'd be like, let me reassure you, yes, yeah. yes, it does. But don't worry, you'll treat your pets like children, and yeah. That's yeah. something else. Uh -huh. You'll dress better, and you'll treat your pets like children. <laughs> yeah, that's something. This is in the 80s, you said? Early, yeah. Early, mm -hmm. mid-80s? Yeah. Who's working in, in, you're in Toronto at that time, That's right? That's right. Who's working around here then that people might know? Um, How, was Howie Mandel around then? No, he was a generation before me. He same was, with, okay. uh, Same with uh, Jim Carrey. Yeah. But they, you know, when I had come on to the scene just as an amateur, their uh, shadows were looming quite large. Mike McDonald was the oh, big name. Oh, he was name. fantastic. Yeah. He was the first comedian that I ever saw on stage, actually. Uh, yeah, I remember him when I was in high school. I remember seeing him at that dingy little club on <laughs> Cumberland, and he, you know, came out with the tennis racket, <laughs> playing it like a guitar. He was he was amazing, yeah. and he's somebody who's spoken in, in his last half of yeah. his career about mental health. Yeah, a lot. He's, he was very open about yeah. his experience. But you know, before he was open about it and sought help, he was a real asshole. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Do you think it was coming from some of the symptoms that he was dealing with, sure. or was he just by nature? Being an asshole. I don't know. I mean, he's always kind of <laughs> gruff, yeah. but, you know, the longer I got to know him, and especially when he became sober and yeah. uh, more honest, it was easy to have compassion and empathy. Mind mm -hmm. you, I had done work by then myself, but, mm -hmm. you know, back then I took it personally and I imagined he was just an asshole. And why sure. is he so, <laughs> you know, why is he like that to me? And I never, you know, I wasn't right. reflecting on my own behavior or his. So I'm sure, you know, there's acting out all over the place. Yeah. Most people that we encounter, anyone who hasn't done any work or had therapy yeah. are just walking around, you know, little activation bombs all day yeah, long. They're sure. just, you know, pre-trigger. Yeah. And they're just waiting for you to, you know, look at them funny or yeah. say the wrong thing, like, excuse me, and, mm -hmm. or do you have the time? And, I mean, I, I'm an introvert I mean? and I have social anxiety. So sure, I'm same just... here. <laughs> I identify that way, too. I just don't want to talk to people most of the time. <laughs> right. But, but, you know, what, but inadvertent yeah. interaction with yeah. people, yeah. you know, how often is it going to go well and how often is it going to go Horribly. Yeah, and then you think about it for the next three weeks. <laughs> for sure. Oh, my God. I still I live it on a daily basis. Yeah. Right. And I have a 14 year old daughter and I'm activated all Oof. the time. And I've been in therapy now for 15 years going on so, more than that. Yeah. So what drew. Well, actually, let's go back a little bit further sure. than what drew you into therapy. But did you, you know, comedians are, are probably m uh, among the most notable group for sure. burning out, for be, for their lives being right. disasters, for suicides. Rob, Suicide. We lost Robin Williams. Totally. We lost so many others. Drug yeah. overdose. And and not even you know not always the the stories you you hear about. Some yeah. some you know are, have been 
Uh, some comedians that we know and love die from substance abuse, and that's a yeah. form of suicide as Absolutely. well, right? Like you drink yourself to death. I'm thinking of Eric Tunney, which you know yeah. is a profound loss for our yeah. community. And there, there's so many out there. So did you? F- how hard is it to not fall into that group when you're, uh, you know, running in those circles as a young person? Especially seeking approval, I think. Right. How, how, uh, well, had it, or did you, I'm making an assumption, did you fall into that kind of lifestyle of drinking and drugs and, um, you know, all the things that comedy I, is known I for? I did, I did, but I, I also have a lot of anxiety, so mm. I would be anxious about losing control, mm. so I could, I could, enjoy, you know, overindulging, mm-hmm. but then the price that I would pay afterwards and not feeling like myself was enough to discourage me from mm. from staying in that place, yeah. right? Like I never, I, I was certainly, you know, a lot of times, especially when I was a road comic and you would stay not in a hotel, but in, you know, the comic apartment. Oh, so <laughs> Wait, I don't know about the comic stuff. apartment. What's the comic the apartment? The comic condo, the comic apartment. It's, you know, a <laughs> club to save money, you know, because they had uh, different people coming through every week as opposed yeah. to s- putting them up in a hotel. You just rent an apartment and then everybody stays in that place. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm just thinking about it now. <laughs> if my daughter told me, I'm, yeah, I'm going to stay with these guys I've never met yeah. for, you know, five days, I'll see you. Yeah. Like, I would never let her do that. <laughs> I can't believe that I survived. But, you know, the it wasn't, um, fortunately, there was never anything overtly threatening to my physical safety, mm-hmm. but emotionally. And the debauchery was <laughs> relentless, not to mention how disgusting men, each of these condos men are. Oh, oh yeah. I thought you were going to say men are. Um, <laughs> well, that's okay. <laughs> it's the, I believe that's the given. That yeah. So actually, did did you, as a woman in comedy, sure. um, now you you um, termed yourself mm-hmm. fella girly, yeah. um, did that help you to be less overtly feminine, I guess, as some other comedians maybe? Well, but that wouldn't dissuade a man in mm. any way. It, it almost brings out a whole different array of attitudes, Interesting. right? It's like, yeah. well, I can turn you. You just haven't mm. had my cock. Do you know what I mean? Wow. So there's yeah. that attitude. Did you attitude encounter that? All the time. Really? And then there yeah. was also, mm, why don't you bring someone home? Uh, Let me watch. Yeah. So there's that. Yeah. God, you know, men are it, gross. It's just <laughs> truly, truly. <laughs> wow. Awful. I mean, you know, but that's human nature. There were a lot of guys who were also incredible and right. kind. You know, right. there were guys that I felt completely safe and hmm. and uh, warm towards and felt respected by 100%. I mean, Did, not as a person, because I think, you know, what the, the common ground is, is that you know, you're lucky you're here or you're funny for a woman. Right. I think that even the the best guys have this mindset that, you know, the comedy is always somehow lesser than. Right. I haven't seen that change, but that is like a huge and profound cultural shift that would right. need to happen. No, I, I mean, although you don't like to talk about your own accomplishments, yeah. you've pr- probably been more successful than most of those people in those I have. comedy condos. I have. Right? It's, <laughs> listen, it's true. I'm, you're right. I struggle to list the accomplishments, but, you know, when I grant myself the the moment's grace to to do that to to reflect because it is how I am able to be 58 now in Mm -hmm. a field that really would prefer that it's only for Mm -hmm. younger people Mm -hmm. I do have to look back and remember I had a turn and I Mm -hmm. and it did really well in in it Mm -hmm. with what I've done and also I've never been better at Mm -hmm. stand-up than I am now because I I, my relationship to it is is so much better, and I I just the craft is never not exciting to me, mm. and so I'm always uh, working on my material. I, I really am amazing at, at stand up, <laughs> and I would never have been able to say that probably not even three years ago. Really? Yeah, I'm really good. Recently. So so yeah, you think really this is this is related to the more than a decade, decade and a half now of therapy? You think? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's just you know. Everything is changed. You know, as I, as I g- gain greater self-awareness through therapy, I also am – and, you know, it's, it, it, I think you need to be in it for a good 10 years before you can begin mm. uh, the hard work of radical self-acceptance, mm. right? Like that is an ongoing struggle, mm. but it is um, – Being okay to fail too, right, and, and learning yeah, something. Yeah, well, or just – 
you know, it, like really accepting your limitations, just stopping the comparison that we do, right? Like, because every time you compare yourself in, in any way mm -hmm. to anything external, you can come up short and you, you know, what's hard is realizing that it's always a false equivalence. Mm. Why? Like you can't compare yourself against anything, mm -hmm. right? Because it's really just, you know, what, how you did it yesterday is really the only thing you, you can compare it to mm -hmm. yourself to. It's mm -hmm. just what you did. Did you, did you do anything differently in a way that might be healthier for your, your heart? or your soul, or your body, then in that case, you're a huge success, mm -hmm. right? If you're mm -hmm. even an incremental shift, and that's all self-acceptance, is just finding um, the way to be okay with yourself internally. Mm -hmm. It's, it's um, I can't believe that it is a struggle, and I think it's a failure of um, the way Western society is, that we don't teach that mm -hmm. in school, Right. Uh, in fact, I think we teach the exact opposite. That sure. You, you can't fail. You can't be vulnerable. Yeah. You, you have to always be successful. Right. And, and so and you, if you're in media, too, people right. will forget you. If, if you, That's the big, biggest fear that people seem to have. Yeah. And I mean, you know, you always have a moment where you realize what's important. And I'm thinking specifically of working for a production company when I was um, writing and directing the judges for MasterChef mm. and the founder of the company. Uh, proper television guy O'Sullivan killed himself mm. and so you know we had this you know grief and in the in the aftermath of the grief there was that real awareness that you know wh why do we drive ourselves like this like how mm. was it that you know there were people who weren't aware that this gregarious outgoing mm. you know man who made you feel so welcome and warm was struggling right like mm. why do we hide that from each other and and then on and continue to just force ourselves to just you have that mentality in the you know tv production business which you know isn't regulated in any way mm -hmm. it's like you do what it takes to get the job done mm -hmm. don't bring your personal shit to work mm -hmm. you just you know hide it and yeah. focus on the work yeah. and you know Show we have this time, get the right, shot yeah, right and, yeah, and stay as long as yeah. it needs to be doesn't matter what yeah. else you have going on in your life like throw your life out of balance in service mm -hmm. of the production and you know then we had this moment where it was like that's crazy yeah. you know look what we're forgetting our humanity and what's important our our connections with each other and we really sat in that place i know i did mm -hmm. for the longest time and now in a couple of years since then mm -hmm. you know everyone's back to working you know yeah. you have this hole this loss that is adjacent and you remember what that was about but the attitude is you kind of fall back into forgetting Habit. what's important yeah. or yeah. just you know you're still working and uh, you know when you by nature of the work that we all do whether it's in entertainment or not you do have to put your own personal life out of balance mm -hmm. and that's what i'm saying is that if we valued this at a young age if you know when our kids went to junior kindergarten and in addition to you know learning how to you know, interact with other people and play with blocks we mm -hmm. focused on empathy mm -hmm. from the jump and mm -hmm. offering strategies for dealing with shame and embarrassment and mm -hmm. anxiety like how much better we'd be served if that was something that you know, you you got when you got out of middle school was a way to to cope yeah. with change. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, we're we're all born with all these fear, feelings and experiences, but nobody ever teaches us how to, what to do with them. Yeah, you're just to supposed to figure it out on yeah. your on your own. And you learn from people who also don't know how to do it. Well, of course. I mean, I you know one of the things I I talk about you know that comes up for me in therapy, you know, because I'm really the place that I'm really stuck is letting go. I don't know how to let go of something. And I have a feeling for a few things that I've held on to them so long. You know, when you, if you imagine yourself physically holding something with mm. your hands and you've held on to it for so long, you don't realize that you're clenched into a knot, like you've stopped mm. feeling it. It's like it's gone numb. It's, it, well, it's exhausting, but you also don't realize that you have to unclench. Right. So I, I, I really struggle with, with letting go. Right. But, and letting go I, in terms of forgiveness? Yeah, or yeah. just anything. Just this concept right. of letting go. Letting go of a hurt right. that I feel like that. Yeah, I used to have this joke about 
uh, relationships because I w- always ended them so badly. Oh. I, and I would just, I, I wouldn't make this joke on stage. I wish she would call me so I could tell her to stop bugging me. Mm-hmm. Right. And so the, it's this idea that I'm holding on to this pain mm-hmm. that people have moved on from. Mm-hmm. So I'm only hurting myself and I can't still mm-hmm. can't let go or move past it. And, you know, just yesterday I, I had therapy and I was telling my therapist it, it was the only way that was modeled for me. Mm-hmm. And my father, uh, who's a man in his 80s, well, I think he's probably 90 he's still 91. alive yeah. yeah he's still alive yeah. uh he, his uh, sister died and uh, in hungary and he never went home never mended the fences like mm. he died being mad at her about something that mm. you know couldn't possibly matter in the end but he somehow feels like he's taught her a lesson yeah. right and does not <laughs> see that you know that he's only hurting himself mm. and and that was my model growing up both parents are, you know, equally have their issues that were undealt with. So imagine you have people who haven't looked at themselves or even seen the value in examining their lives, Mm. raising another human, Mm -hmm. obviously. And that's in addition to generational trauma that just gets passed on. Sure. So, I mean, I notice this as a parent as well, when your kids start doing all the things that you hate about yourself or that remind you about things that happened to you as a kid. And and they don't know. They're just living their life, right? How have you been dealing with that? You have a 14-year-old and a (laughs) 10-year-old now. Well, I'm so glad I do comedy because I do, you know, I get get a lot of, um, I'm able to to be reassured that I'm not doing it well by how, um, how successful those uh, jokes are, right? Like it's always... You know, when I talk about my kids, first of all, I check with my kids before mm. I'm going to talk about this on stage. Is it OK? Do mm. you mind? And, you know, initially they they said I could never tell. And then mm. as they got older, they would come to the shows and they could see that the joke was always – well, there was a, a double thing going on there. The joke it was usually a, at my expense. Mm-hmm. But they also, you know, by uh, extension got a little – Hey, people are laughing at a story about me. Right. I'm the star of the story. Yeah, you're, and, you're, they're part of mom's work. Right. right? So they, it was, uh, they've been more agreeable, yeah. uh, you know, when I tell them, you know, what, what the story is going to be about. Because I have, and the reason it's so important for me is that when I was a kid, my mother, who was very outgoing, mm-hmm. um, would have no problem you know, if we went to a Hungarian restaurant for dinner, can you imagine a Hungarian family on their night out going out to a Hungarian restaurant? My life was an absolute hell. Uh, but she would tell these. I feel like that's a really niche observation, but okay. She would tell, um, well, why can't we try any other cuisine? We eat this. Don't we eat this every day? You know what? Let's let's go out for dinner. Where should we go? Hungarian food. And she would, but she would tell the server stories about about me. Mm. Just, you know, all, like crazy things that, that her kid did. I was right there and I would be crying. I would be crying. Oh. would be turned, you know, facing the wall, begging her to stop. Embarrassing Into, stories? Or? Yes, of course. Mm. Mortifying yeah. stories, right? I went to camp for a week, uh, overnight camp, and I didn't change underwear the entire time. I don't know why. I was afraid to reach into my duffel bag. That's the actual truth. Yeah. But hearing her tell a complete stranger and having them have a great laugh at my expense, I was nine. Right. You know your kids, how sensitive they are Mm -hmm. so it was um so important to me that i check in with my kids before Mm -hmm. i do material Mm -hmm. about them that being said um i also in addition to like i said the reassurance that i get that we're all making the same mistakes as as parents you know one of the things i've been has come up recently in my material is that I haven't found like what I'm uh, I'm having trouble with, especially the 14 year old. Mm. Like I really can't get my kids to do anything right. I want. I, I can't like I want. <laughs> I I don't know why I thought I would have movie children, but right. I think that in my mind that's actually what I wanted. When I thought of having kids, I thought of having kids that I've seen in the movies mm-hmm. without realizing that everyone's looked at the same script and they're waiting to speak because that's what it says on the page in real life they just talk all the fucking time (laughs) 
<laughs> they all of the are they're they're relentlessly demanding. They don't think anything that I have an existence outside of serving them. It's mm-hmm. bananas. So I have, can't have get they them told you off yet. Co- constantly, <laughs> but they, but they, they just their expectation that I will be there. I get no compliance right. from them, no compliance at all. And that, you know, partly to blame is my own parenting. I didn't set boundaries mm-hmm. on them. I didn't have expectations of them. I just imagined that my goodness would <laughs> reflect goodness back at me. I didn't mm-hmm. realize that what it, what would happen is that they would just see it as permission to right. indulge in even worse yeah. behavior. Yeah. So, Oh, they're different people with their own minds. Right. But, <laughs> wow. but, but yeah. remember, you know, I grew up with parents who used fear and shame. Right. to get the kind of behavior that they wanted to get cooperation mm-hmm. they you know it was like torture mm-hmm. m- emotional torture mm-hmm. to get what they wanted and i haven't found anything as successful on the on the healthy end that will get me cooperative mm-hmm. behavior as fear and shame like there's mm-hmm. a part of me that's like perhaps i should start shaming and fear <laughs> because give that a try it's right to work because for, uh, because for listening others, yeah. to them and holding their precious feelings right. gets me fuck off and so <laughs> Just now brush your teeth <laughs> right so now i'm not now i'm, I'm still dealing with the lingering after effects of yeah. ba- bad parenting and now i'm having bad childrening yeah. like I'm, I'm getting it at both ends yeah. uh, the and the difference is as my therapist says you're dumb Daughter, your daughter lashing out is age appropriate, mm-hmm. right? Your daughter blaming you for everything that's horrible in her life mm-hmm. is age appropriate. Your mother blaming you for everything that was horrible in your life is not age appropriate. Mm-hmm. As soon as my daughter hit 13, it was a, a huge regression mm-hmm. in my therapy because there wasn't anything that happened between my daughter and I that wasn't triggering me. I was mm-hmm. no longer uh, an adult in, mm. in my interactions with her. I would start as an adult. Mm. Then she would say something, and then I was gone. I was mm. gone. And then in some cases, she was more emotionally, as she was older emotionally, in mm. those interactions than I was. What was your life like when you were, uh, so now we're switching the therapy thing, but when you were 11, 12, 13 years old, what was it, what was it like for you? It was pretty brutal. Yeah. 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 It was, uh, individuation was not allowed to happen from your mother separating yeah. from your mother yeah. or your father both both my parents i mean my yeah. my father was um he's he's a, a real a special case and i and i have uh, the compassion i have for my parents is that you know they lived uh, unexamined lives mm-hmm. in a time where that was you know it wasn't even a mindset mm. right so it's not like they they didn't have the opportunity. No, no one thinks that way. I mean, when I started going to therapy, this is 15 years ago, and I would tell my mother, you know, ask her about stuff. She's like, why are you talking? You know, why you need to be happy? Right? Like life, life just is life. You, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's hard. And, and uh, you know, it's one of my... Uh, Your family Catholic? They are Catholic. <laughs> okay, <yeah>. just a hunch. <laughs> Life is hard. <laughs> Life is hard. And, and and I would say in my act, that's nice to hear when you're two. Yeah. <laughs> right. And which, yeah. and I, which I follow up with uh, right until I learned how to read. It was my mother who used to read me bedtime stories. And yeah. they always ended like this. And they all live happily ever after. Ha! Like hell they did. <laughs> now go to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> this reminds me so much of my own childhood. <laughs> yeah. So it was, you know, and the, the teen years were, were particularly yeah. hard. And I think sure. for a lot of people, you know, it's very easy to be stuck emotionally mm. forever mm-hmm. some point in your teen years because teens are also able to function alone in the world. So it's mm-hmm. very difficult to reintegrate that yeah. part of myself. Well, and you you also don't realize at that time but at many other times in your life – uh, that there are other times of your life, right? Uh, when you're a teenager, you only have 12 years of experience to real, and you think that's going to be your whole life. Or you're stuck in that little place. Nobody's letting you do or, or be yourself, right? Uh, and nothing will ever change, right? You got the whole rest of your life <laughs> to be messy and to figure it out and to make right. mistakes, right? Right. But you don't have that knowledge at that time. Y- you don't, and and also, you know, a teenager can hide in your adult self. Mm you know, kind of in plain sight because Mm -hmm. they are so high functioning, right? Right. Like it's a lot easier if you have some trauma from when you were four, 
that childish behavior is so much easier to recognize in yourself that it's a lot easier to also soothe. And one of the things that when I had kids, um, you know, my therapist would help me with because I would have a struggle having this self compassion. Mm -hmm. And she'd say, well, if your three-year-old was feeling this way or your four-year-old, well, what would you say? And oh my God, it was so easy to imagine Mm -hmm. telling my four-year-old son, you know, reassuring them that it was okay to Mm -hmm. make a mistake or to feel sad. And I couldn't do that for myself. Mm -hmm. I could do it with, for my four-year-old, couldn't do it to myself. That helped, right? Seeing that, I, you know, she'd say, well, then just Turn what you just said to your imaginary four-year-old son. Mm. Just say that to your four-year-old self. Mm. And that was a a lot of the work at the time. What do you think you've learned from your kids? I mean, so often we think of of parents as being the teachers, but parents are students of their children, I think. I've I've learned openness, Mm. right? Like just a, a, a curiosity. Like their baseline is to really just wonder Mm. because that hasn't been you know, snuffed out of them Mm. or socialized out of them enough. So wonder, openness, curiosity, because those things, when you meet the world that way with an openness and a curiosity, um, you, you can take, you can take more in and it's a way to, you know, examine yourself in any situation Mm. without judgment. Mm Because as soon as you start judging, you are, you, you know, you're, taking yourself back in time you can there's a risk of of activating yourself and mm-hmm. then suddenly you're no longer your adult self but you're looking as a more hurt version of yourself mm-hmm. S- sometime in the past calling attention mm-hmm. right like that's really the function of my traumatized younger selves mm-hmm. is to get my attention yeah. i'm stuck here this doesn't feel good how can you help me mm-hmm. and you know a lot of times my response is don't be an idiot don't be a baby shut up suck it up mm-hmm. Right. You're such a loser. And all of those things just keep my wounded places mm-hmm. intact because That's what's I'm keeping them stuck. Right, there in the exactly. First place. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, one of the most incredible things, uh, connections that I've made in my work about three years ago, I wanted to move to different level. It might be four years now. It coincides funnily enough with Hannah Gadsby's show. It came out. That I performed the day before I did this really? show that was that I was so profoundly proud of, and it was the culmination of the year before. I had attempted to do a stand-up comedy show where first half of the show I would just, you know, host and bring out a, a bunch of women that I thought were amazing. We take an intermission in the second half. I would do more of a theatrical piece. I would use the stage more. I had, um, it, I, I didn't allow myself this as much latitude as being in the moment, mm-hmm. right, of just riffing mm-hmm. on whatever came up. I had these beats that I was going to hit, and it was uh, based on a dream I had about actually dragging a giant sled of luggage around. Mm-hmm. It was a you know really important dream at the time, and when I shared this as the foundation for this, uh, way to do stand-up comedy, and I shared it with my girlfriend, and she said, yeah, it's a bit obvious, a sled full of baggage, which <laughs> was hilarious and true, but I still, I, I said, trust me. Right. And yeah. I unpacked these various pieces of luggage, because it wasn't just a sled full of baggage. Yeah. It was very specific bags, mm-hmm. and I placed these bags on stage and would then move to these different spots and talk about who I was in relationship to that particular bag. And I didn't realize until I had finished the entire performance that these were actually all of my wounded selves. There was the four-year-old, the nine-year-old, the 16-year-old, 25, and then my adult self. I didn't make that connection, right? Like, you have to do it. And and so I developed that idea even further for this show that uh, I did the day before Nanette dropped, uh, which, you know, was such a depart. Like, it wasn't strictly stand-up. It was mm-hmm. much more comedy-focused mm-hmm. than anything uh, Hannah Gadsby did. So, mm-hmm. you know, there there's a there's no crossover oh, yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. But it was this idea that I, did, I could break the limits of stand-up by yeah. talking about deeply personal and profoundly difficult topics. Mm-hmm. And in that, you know, between these two uh, shows, this, this evolution, I realized that what happens 
and what has always happened for me in stand-up is all of the parts of me that have the trauma, that have experienced trauma in my life, that I take to therapy and we do the crying and the healing and all of that work to recognize their existence and try to integrate them with my 58-year-old self. When I'm on stage, those same parts of me exist in joy. So when I'm when I do the stuff about about being a little kid, I'm actually my four year old like I've never been more animated. Mm. So that is my four year old self, who's normally exists only in trauma. I'm connecting with that part of me in pure joy. Yeah, They're on stage it. playing, yeah. and you know the same with every part of me. They it's the same injured parts. But they are, when I take them on stage, we're celebrating, we're enjoying each other's company. Mm -hmm. And it's like I, because I'm so focused on the present, nothing else is intruding. And that's why I love Mm -hmm. stand up now. It's because I get to interact with these parts of myself that I normally only experience in pain or discomfort. Mm -hmm. And we're on stage playing. We're having a great time. And, and I, you know, we, there's no room because we're so focused on the work yeah. that it's just, it's joy. But and this it's, is it. it's love. Joy is the work. You have to do the work. Sure. You can't just run from your triggers right. your whole right. life because they're going to keep you captive. They're going to, to keep adding more and more right. baggage. So you have to be able to. Otherwise, what, what other choice do you have? Right. Just carry well, that you, around with you? And that, but. I don't know how I would do it if I didn't have mm. this work. I don't know how else people find it. Like, how do you mm-hmm. connect with your joy? Uh, you know, I, I I do much the same thing. I, I've done – I've had depression for longer than I haven't now. So I don't know a life yeah. w- without it. It took me a lot of work to realize that I'm not the type of person uh, who thinks that I'm cursed to live with this for the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. My Irish Catholic mother used to tell me, maybe this is just your cross to bear. Yeah, right. I was like, I don't want to do that. Right. <laughs> Have you seen Passion of the Christ? <laughs> 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 but, so I, I've done a lot of work to re-narrate that to, to a certain level of gratitude uh, for those traumas and for those struggles and, right. and all the awful things that people said and did. It's like, yeah, you know, this idea – in dialectical behavior therapy and, and, and mindfulness and many other traditions yeah. of acceptance and change, yeah. that you can accept something because right. it happened. It's just a fact. Yeah. You don't have to imbue it with a lot of judgment. You don't have to right. to let it control you. It just is. Right. And I find, to come back to your earlier point about letting go, <laughs> weirdly enough, by accepting, that's how you let it go. It's like, mm. yes, this happened. And now right. I can release it from me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah. that's I think that's how I've been able to that's come to good. terms with the fact that Depression has and anxiety uh, have been part of me, yeah. but they don't define me. Right. That I accept them and that's okay and now I can go do right. other things. It's it's an onion peel. Mm-hmm. I, I find that a lot. Like you really – you have this core of whatever your issues. It's never going to change. It's not mm-hmm. like you're going to uncover anything else. But you – as you peel off the layers, mm-hmm. you – with each layer, it, it presents itself in just a slightly mm. different way. Like the work is always the same. It's always the same. But you also get to decide what that meaning is. Mm-hmm. You can call that onion an apple if you want to. That's up to you. For sure. For and sure. nobody else can tell you otherwise. Of course. You know? yeah. And I, I did want to mention this this piece of advice that you gave me yeah. just in the course of doing your thing <laughs> that you never realized that uh, you did. And I wouldn't even have expected you to. But one of my escapes as a as a kid, I was diagnosed. I, my, my first suicide attempt when I was twelve, but I'd been struggling for right. years prior to that. Um, and one of my escapes was to put on the little thirteen-inch tube TV in my basement uh, apartment or my basement uh, bedroom in, in our house uh, and watch Just for Laughs. Mm. And I saw so many of you and Mike McDonald right. and uh, uh, Mitch Hedberg and so yeah, many other yeah. people performing that that was my escape. That's where I learned, I think earliest to be joyful and to laugh and mm-hmm. to use that as an escape and that it was cathartic right. uh, for me. So when I brought you out to uh, to St. Thomas when I was an undergrad, I think in probably 2008, maybe something like that, nobody, hardly anybody came because I was a terrible event planner, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> it turns out. Right. I had been trying to do these awareness events to get people talking about mental health in right. more than just hospital-y kind of diagnosis mm-hmm. context. Yeah, that's important, but I want to see it in other contexts. That's how I right. learned. 
Uh, so we brought you out to do your to do your show. You were fantastic, but I think about twelve people came, and six of them bought the same block of tickets, so they were all <laughs> one group. And you got up on stage. Uh, I think the sponsor for the event had left halfway through the show because it was such a shit show. It was just a mess. Uh, we were going to have a wine and cheese beforehand, but the university found out and told us that we weren't allowed to. Wow. wow. <laughs> so anyway, now I'm now I'm just reliving my own event yeah, planning oh, trauma. Geez. Then you got on stage, and one of the first things you said was. Uh, that you had learned, I think, or, or that your advice was that if people can't show up for you, then fuck them. <laughs> and I have used that on stage. Right. I think I tweeted at you at one point years ago, maybe. I don't know. But I, I don't usually talk about it uh, outside of that context. But that's been such an important piece of advice for me, that if other people have a problem with who you are and how you live right. and the mistakes that you've made, uh, then that's your problem, not yeah. yours. Your acceptance and your healing and your letting go is your Right. is your responsibility. So I want to thank you for that after all these years. Well, that's very kind. I would I would amend it now if you know with <laughs> even do. with another with uh, all the onion peeling that I've done is that the averse is true as well that mm-hmm. you have to show up for people and that's Absolutely. something that I never I never appreciated and it's been a mark of of real success in my life yeah. that that I have understood that the importance of that because i do think that you know i think this is part of tying into the this, the ambivalence i feel of letting people know what, that i have a show is that i is that i think i don't matter yeah. right like who's going to miss me if i'm not there and that's what showing up is about mm-hmm. is showing other people like it, it's not about you and not thinking about you as much it's are you there for somebody mm. Maybe, somebody else. Maybe that's something else you've learned from your kids. No, they're fuckers. <laughs> Is it okay if we leave it there? Yeah, let's do. Elvira <laughs> Kurt, uh, legendary Canadian comedian. Uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thanks for having I, me. I really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, me too. And, and I hope that. I think this is one of the deepest conversations we've had on here, of a pretty deep podcast. I think this is one of the deepest we've had. So I want to thank you for that and for the work that you're doing. And I look forward to seeing the ever-evolving career of Elvira Kerr. Well, thanks so much, Mark. I had a really good time. Thanks for asking me. I mean it. That's it. That's my conversation with comedian Elvira Kurt. Uh, I, I was so privileged uh, to talk with her. Like I, I, we said a number of times in the conversation, we hadn't, uh, I'd only met her in person the one time, but I had seen her perform on television uh, so many times before that. Uh, and then that little piece of advice, if people can't show up for you, fuck them. <laughs> and then I liked her her additional bit of context that she added that for to that too, that you've got to show up for others. I think that's a really such an important message and uh, uh, she's the perfect, uh, Elvira is the perfect one to deliver it. So uh, thank you, Elvira. I, I would highly recommend that if you can catch her, she performs a lot, uh, mostly lately in and around Toronto, but she's traveled all over the place too. So if you get a chance to see her live act, I, I would really highly encourage you uh, to get out and do that. Uh, while you're here listening to this one, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not check out some of the 60 plus others that we have up on uh, Apple Podcasts right now? You can head over there. Uh, if you have an iPhone or an Apple device, uh, click the subscribe button. Uh, leave us a rating, a little star rating down at the bottom and maybe some comments as well. That'd be nice. I love reading them. Uh, and tag me on social media. I'm on uh, I'm at Mark Hennick at M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K on uh, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, LinkedIn, everywhere else. I'm, I'm all over the place, so I'm, I'm not hard to find. And markhennick.com, M-A-R-K-H-E-N-I-C-K.com. I post a lot of the episodes up there, but then there's a bunch of my other work, my speaking engagements, and my contact information is all on there as well. Uh, in addition to Apple Podcasts, you can get the show on uh, Spotify, on Google Podcasts, on uh, we put them up on YouTube as well, on Deezer, everywhere else. So everywhere you get your podcasts, uh, you can get this show. Uh, I think that's it. I'd like to thank everybody who's involved here at E1, Adrian and Kimberly and Allison and everybody else. And, uh, my, of course, our great editor, Dave Trafford, uh, who, who brings the shows uh, together, who assembles the shows for us. Uh, and to you for listening. So thank you all so much for supporting So-Called Normal. I'm Mark Hennick. Mark Hennick.